Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Discover New Music podcast from us at Full Pelt Music. Shortly, we'll be joined by Ed Barnes to talk about his single, Criticise the Poor, which we've featured recently over on our Discover New Music playlist on Spotify. But before then, the usual reminders from myself, if you would, please do follow us on social media. We are on Facebook at Full Pelt and on Twitter and Instagram at Full Pelt Music. And of course, if you would, please do hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, wherever you are watching or listening. Well, welcome Ed Barnes to the Discover New Music podcast. Um, absolutely delighted to have you on. Really enjoyed uh, Criticise the Poor, your single, which we've just featured over on our playlist. Um, so yeah, yeah, looking forward to chatting with you. How are you today? I'm good, man. Yeah, as we spoke before, it's night time. So yeah. it's quite it's quite a really nice way to end a Sunday. Like it's just a do this so yeah i'm stoked i'm great man yeah Thanks for me. oh absolute pleasure absolute pleasure so i really enjoyed the single uh and we'll talk about that in just a moment but um regular listeners will know we always start off with the same um portion of the podcast is what we call the origin story so of course yeah. you know quite often bands will tell me about how they all met but of course you know you you are solo um so yeah. you know how how did you come to the position you are now putting out music um you know what what is your origin story to get you to this oh, point? Myself. yeah yeah so i started off um when i was a teenager um played in like punk rock bands and so we pretty much were just like we called something like delivered leftovers or something one of those really long teenage band names <laughs> and we pretty much just played in parties and stuff and we just Half the set would be some scrappy originals that we'd written together, and then half the set would pretty much be Black Flag covers. So it was super. There was that, and then when I was seventeen years old, um, I had the opportunity to join this um, kind of power pop punk band on bass guitar, and it was like I had a quite a tough time in high school. So it was at the. I think you guys call it O levels, but we have the HSC. Is that right? It's like the final school exam. And we had, um, it was towards those last weeks, we got an email from a band asking if I could join because they just heard my band. And luckily I did. And then on the week I finished my last HSC exam, I had my first gig, which was supporting a band called Radio Birdman, um, who I'm not sure if they're, they're legendary in Australia in terms mm. of, Australian punk rock um and they were that was at a Manning, the Manning bar in Sydney which is like a large venue too so it was my first proper gig and I'd only turned 17 two weeks I sorry 18 like two weeks before so it was the first time I actually also stepped into a venue like that as well and it was just mind-blowing and sick like and um then after that we kind of throughout the years about I was with that group for about five years and we just did constant Australian touring like and um we developed quite a resume like we got to play with um flogging molly um beans on toast your mate I know <laughs> um, yeah. um Marky Ramones CJ Ramones Stiff Little Fingers the Ruts Ruts DC now um even Glenn Matlock, like there was like, yeah. it was just a constant, like we, we were pretty much the like kind of classic sounding punk rock band, you know, like our collectively our favorite band was the Ramones by far. Yeah. And we definitely, it was definitely obvious. <laughs> um, but I just got to a point where I was kind of like, it wasn't doing it for me much anymore personally, even though that music I still love so dearly. But I was super personally into my, like, Billy Bragg. Um, I don't know if you know him over there, but Paul Kelly, he's a bit of an Australian kind of punky poet sort of guy. Um, well, Frank Turner and stuff. And then yeah. I thought, and it was actually after seeing Beans on Toast, because we played with him at with, like, Flogging Molly at that show together. And it was like, God, I can do this, you know, because I had all these songs written and stuff. And yeah and now it's been about three years since i played my first solo gig actually three years in a few week in about two weeks time and i've recorded an album um i played with grace petrie yeah she, she, yeah, yeah yeah she's yeah. a legend she's amazing yeah, definitely um and that was my second gig a few years ago and it was right 
before COVID happened. Like, like it was like, maybe Grace Petrie, the next day she's on an emergency flight back to Heathrow and all my gigs and tours that were booked for that year have just been cancelled. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I recorded an album in that time and now I'm ready to kind of, I've started trickling it out. I've released two singles thus far. Um, I'm releasing another one in February on the February 17th. And yeah, hopefully album in September, I'll drop the album then. Yeah. yeah if, I, I forget that I'm a bit of a, under my name, I'm a bit of a separate entity, like of just releasing two of course. singles. But because I'm a bit like, what do you mean? I've been around for years. But <laughs> so I forget that constantly but yeah 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 it's an interesting topic actually because in these in this day and age you know streaming figures and social media numbers and all this be have become all too important really um yeah. and i was uh a couple of weeks ago we had uh, a gentleman called ryan ryan hamilton from america um on on the podcast so his uh played in a number of bands um over the years uh and then right once he uh, sort of went out solo he, he had the idea of having a different band name for each album so ryan hamilton and the traitors ryan hamilton and the harlequin ghost and he said it was only recently really when he realized that hang on a moment like all of my figures that you know everyone monitors these days are spread out across all these projects and it makes me look yeah. like i'm a new artist when actually i've been yeah. around for like you know 15 plus years so i guess yeah, yeah. that's something you're kind of coming up against as well yeah, yeah, totally. Um, even though I only played bass in that kind of band, this is my first yeah. time kind of in front of it. I can definitely like see that being an issue. It'd be like Neil Young and Crazy Horse, or yeah. like the amount of projects Neil Young's been in versus Promise of the Real. You know, he's got yeah. so much. I think there's a way you can actually edit that to put them in there. But yeah, it is. I think you're right too. It is a bit too important to kind of compare. Am I saying? I think Spotify figures versus yeah. what's actually happening when you play. You know I exactly. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, the number of people that turn up to the to your shows for me is always the biggest kind of metric of, of how you're doing, rather than anything like that. Um, but yeah, so obviously, criticize the poor uh, is is going to be on on the album when it comes out. Um, yeah, and obviously that's the track we've just featured over on our Discover New Music playlist. Um, yeah. So, what can you tell us uh, about that track? Um, you know, obviously um, some important subjects touched upon, but also obviously just a, a really really um, awesome sort of you know punk folk track um so yeah how did that song come together for you um well luckily he's out of office now but we had um similar he's a bit we had he's like a boris johnson of us yeah. um scott morrison he was a the liberal party in australia it's funny when i say this because i know people say liberal they think left wing but the liberals are the are the tories here yeah. and um Oh God, he would he would just say so much useless crap. Um he there's song lyrics in there where I just straight up quote him like have a go to get a go. You know, where if he would be talking about let's say renters can't afford rents now in Sydney, he'd just be like, Well, you gotta have a go to get a go. Like, you know, he wouldn't actually listen to any problems. And he was uh, pretty much he was he ran the most corrupt government in modern australia history and um it was kind of just during COVID and such like the, the classism that he showed was just mm. super super obvious and he was protected by um the murdoch media super hard that was another thing um so it became on kind of one of those things um it was uh, kind of interesting because the first time i wrote those lyrics where it says criticise the poor and follow Murdoch's law, follow Dutton's law. It just lists Australian politicians and media modules, pretty much. I, the first time I wrote it was actually all Thatcher's law, <laughs> every single time. Um, and then, but then my friend, who's not really into his politics, was like, oh, I thought that was like a physics thing, like Newton's law. Like, so, I was like, oh, shit, God's sake. so I made it a bit more obvious for Australians yeah. to pick what i'm talking about um with that sort of part um it's actually also based on um i borrowed some of the phrasing off um which side are you on by billy bragg and um well i think pete seeger wrote the original one but yeah um i kind of 
took that sort of thing because it's like it's almost a bit of a union song but it's also just a bit of a you know um um anti-government song sort yeah. of thing but yeah um that's where that kind of came from um it wasn't initially going to be my first single in fact i wanted the album to be dropped by then but it was just kind of like that election is due in may <laughs> I'm at least criticise the poor with it after that, especially if he loses. That means just for yeah. I went in off and I went in. Um, I quickly scrambled everything together to get that out. Um, and let's say with the music video, um, that was another quote of him. Um, I don't know if you heard about this in the UK, but he Australia has quite a bad bushfire season. Yeah, at times like it just the crops go, everything's gone. Often people lose houses and people die. But Scott Morrison was in Hawaii during it and he lied about it to the press. Yeah. Saying like media advisors said that he wasn't there. And then then he legitimately posed for a photo on Waikiki Beach. Like <laughs> the guy. So and then when he, he was on the radio and um this is when he said famously on the radio it's like look mate i don't hold a hose i don't know what you expect me to do so i went around i actually got some still here but um and made these core flutes because i knew the yeah. election was enough and i went up and just kind of stuck them around sydney would vote one advance and i actually had like an independent candidate kind of like start following me on twitter and stuff like that <laughs> around and i think uh, i think there's a lot of confusion between local politicians about who is this guy but yeah, that's pretty much that. I'm glad the song's still relevant because, like, when I kind of come to the UK, I plan on changing the, some of the lyrics and such, you know. Yeah. you got Nax still there and so on. Like, Murdoch's still there. Unfortunately, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm kind of glad that it's become timeless, even though it was quite about a specific person at the time, you know. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it has. And, and uh, you know, it crosses borders as well because, you know, obviously the link is obvious to, to us over in this country with the Tories. But mm. you know, sadly, you know, in so many countries across the world now, you know, we're, we're finding, um, you mm. know, similar situations. Uh, and obviously, you know, it, it's I think it's a relevant song that, you know, listeners um, will be able to relate to quite easily um, mm. for, for wherever they live, really. Um, and yeah. I've, I've discussed with a number of artists recently um, and, um, you yeah, know, obviously excluding the kind of artists you've uh, toured with and obviously mentioned already, because there are some artists out there that are obviously uh, doing the good work and obviously uh, mixing yeah. politics with 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 music, mm. which is kind of a faux pas these days. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to touch on with you as well, as I have with some others recently, you know, how important is it to you to be able to use the platform that you have to discuss such topics because it, again it feels to me that a lot of that has gone away you know you mentioned a lot of the artists Billy Bray you know yeah not to, not to age them but it's quite a while ago and, and our, newer artists these days are almost afraid to alienate audiences because they're competing for you know such a thin slice of an audience um that they yeah. don't want to alienate them but of course you know um I think politics does belong in music uh and clearly I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to agree with me on that one yeah, I 100% do. And I also think, like, if you do have something to say and it's worth believing in, you should say it. You shouldn't not. Like, how, I don't know how polarizing a topic can, like, I don't understand in art how, how a political position in art can be such a polarizing topic when literally, conservative governments do not fund arts very yeah. often. It's like like they're against you from that angle as well. And so on and so forth. So many, some people just straight up aren't political, which I get, but I don't think you shouldn't be afraid to say it. Um kind of like this often with my kind of Ramones esque punk band, um, we'd often I'd try to write pen a political song and they'd be like, oh we're not kind of about that, which I kind of get because it's just reminds, it's just straight up party rock. But I don't know, I felt like I personally had a bit more to say. And also, all the memorable, a lot of memorable songs are political. Yeah. That being said, I think, like, you know, um, using my platform as a 
pretty much a straight white male. I'm pretty lucky I can get up there and do it. That's the other part too. Um, because it's like people just, I do have that opportunity to share and kind of do such a thing um, when I do, without intruding on other people, you know, reserving for my own space and letting other people have their space too. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say about that? Um, but I feel like music can still is still very political in other ways. Like I feel like Lil Nas X, for example, like, I think that person's existence at the moment is political, let's say, yeah. of two minorities, let's say, black and homosexual, but still kicking up a storm and selling out stadiums. I think that really, I think that stuff still really says something, you know. I feel like, I feel like it's still, I feel like it is everywhere and you shouldn't really shy from it, you know. And you only have to open your eyes to see political things happening. Of course. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, yeah. and and it, it reminds me again because we've we've brought up uh, Billy Bragg. You know, I, I was um, talking with uh, a different Billy actually, Billy from the Subways recently on the po on our podcast, and um, we talked about Billy Bragg, and I, I mentioned how I'd seen Billy live recently, and um, literally stood next to an annoying crowd of people talking through the show, which is a pet hate of mine, um, always annoying. Um, but yeah, you know, one of them suddenly pipes up. Why does he have to be so political all the time? Why can't he just play his songs? It's like, well, have you never listened to his songs? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, Christ. Yeah, I, I heard someone who said like they only like. I just don't know. I can when he's so political, I only like his love songs. And I was like, well, you need to read a book. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, yeah. Yeah. again it's I think, and i feel like most music is political you just need to look at it from a different angle at times maybe if it's not explicitly political there's other things going on there yeah mm. and i think perhaps there is certainly an element of society that just want to be oblivious to, to what's going on and want to be oblivious yeah. to what's in the songs because obviously you know to be fair it, it's scary if you actually are in touch with what's going on out there in the real world so that's probably why they do turn away but um you know uh we'll, we'll we'll get away and and try and well i was gonna say try and talk about some uh <laughs> some more light-hearted subjects but, but actually <laughs> yeah but actually i'm gonna move on to to the pandemic which wasn't light-hearted yeah. in, in any sense yeah. of the word but actually um something that i really loved reading about from, from yourself uh was your awning sessions because of course the pandemic oh, right. yeah the pandemic was obviously horrible for, for everyone obviously you know devastating for for a lot of people um that lost you know loved ones and everything and obviously just a horrible couple of years for the world um but i i do like just to shine a little light where we can on the, the kind of nice yeah. stories that came out of it and, and and i really loved um the concept of what you did with the, with the awning session so you know, how did that concept how did you you know come up with with doing those well luckily we just had a i lived on I don't know if you know much about Sydney, but Newtown, which is like the kind of kind of vibey place for live right. music and stuff. I'm, I'm luckily I lived above like a shacky shop above there with with my drummer um, at that time. Well, he's still my drummer. I meant living there at the time. Yeah. We just haven't. <laughs> and um, we just um, I just had a had an idea because I had about um, eight shows cancelled for the next month. Um, I was kind of like, it was like my second gig supporting Grace and then it was everything cancelled and I was going to release my first single and everything, um, but it all just kind of got pulled out from underneath me. Luckily I didn't, luckily I went on to record an album and come up, come up with a much more planned release now, but um, yeah, but I'm actually kind of thankful for that. Yeah. <laughs> At least it's no one, but um, yeah, so I was in, I was in that mindset and you know, I know everyone kind of, I still wanted to do something, you know, because everyone was pretty downtrodden and stuff. So I got caught up a friend, Stefan, and he dropped over a PA. I kind of tested it to see if it would stand on this awning. And I was like, it works. We can do this. And I can stand on it. Because we used to sit and drink there, like, maybe at, like, 3 a.m. after a yeah. long night. And I just kind of have a relax on there or something like that. Um and we just decided Sunday afternoon we'll live stream it and such. It turned out um, the lead singer 
it just I mean sorry I'll get back to get to that story later but it was like just super it was just super fun I was actually yeah. really I would just piss everyone off on my street like <laughs> just like you know but then the balcony like I was getting so getting DMs from all my neighbors and stuff and then because you could still have one person over at those times like I could see people in the studio apartments across from us, like having like little parties and stuff like that. <laughs> like, and then when I, I never, I, I don't really do covers live, but for that I did. And it was like, I did like a Rolling Stone. I could legit hear the balconies of people singing back the lyrics. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And then, then crowds gathered at the bottom and like a lot of the neighbors I knew started timing their, you know, one hour a day outside activity to come to that part <laughs> of up down my street and have me watch. It was, the, it was the best. It was actually um, some of the most ridiculous fun I've had um, doing that. And it was a, it was the lead singer of the DMAs lived across the road from me. So I got the tip. He, I think his wife messaged me with a selfie. I was like, got the tip of the hat from him. I was like, oh, that's nice. sick. Yeah. They're, they're huge in Australia. I know they're pretty big in the UK. Yeah. Think, but yeah um so i was like that's amazing i didn't even know he lived there but um yeah that was that was actually some of my favorite gigs in my life i reckon those those shows yeah. they were, they were my favorite like because it's just kind of a bit inventive i mean massive beatles fan so yeah. didn't take but i was like yeah this was that was sick that was um mm, that that yeah. was very Walking. and even like you know i was a bit nervous about cops but i was a bit like what could they do but then cops started watching you know <laughs> like, it was actually amazing mm. yeah a beautiful thing and, and it does still feel weird you know to, to talk about beautiful things coming out of the pandemic because it was such a horrible yeah. time but uh, so many artists that i talked to you know it, it presented um opportunity where opportunity didn't exist because they're normally in a touring cycle and a recording cycle and all of a sudden I had all this spare time to to get creative and to do yeah. different things and obviously I, I loved the idea of the awning sessions um and, and obviously yeah, it was a fantastic thing not just for you but obviously for everyone that could witness it um and obviously brought a bit of light during dark times of course the other thing you touched on was you know for yourself again obviously being able to spend some time and obviously get this album worked on um, yeah. which perhaps you may not have had the opportunity if it wasn't for the pandemic so I mean yeah. you, you've touched on September as a potential release date um obviously what should people that are, are getting into you now through obviously the singles coming out what should they expect from the album as a whole when it does arrive all right so I've I've released some of the punk on it um I released the song all things which was a bit of more of the kind of narrow narrative based lyric lyric writing i do um my next single i'll just say love poem and a bookmark which is coming out in february um that's a very lyric based one um you can expect everything like really i'm not trying to sound too like viva rock star <laughs> and stuff but um it's like it's got about it's got some punk rock it's even got a bit of country at the end of it like there's banjos, there's cellos, there's violins. Like we kind of packed it all in. Um, what I'm kind, what it's kind of like is a bit of um, it's a bit of Billy Bragg style in there, solo electric guitar. There's a bit of um, just kind of Aussie rock style, and then there is punk rock. So there's kind of a fair bit of everything in there, um, except with I'm gonna say. Just kind of narrative based storytelling. That's pretty yeah. much it. It's a storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, certainly whets the appetite, and listeners um, obviously um, need to check it out when it comes out. So, obviously, the best way to stay up to date, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, uh, best way to stay up to date with everyone these days is social media. So, obviously, anyone listening to the podcast that wants to keep up uh, to date with Ed and what he's up to, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, I believe as well, all uh, Ed Barnes AU, which makes my life easier. I love when an artist has the yeah. same handle on each one. <laughs> and I only do TikTok because I have to. Uh, same, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I look at that app and it is a sensory overload, like the second <laughs> I open it. I just see someone dancing or screaming or some crazy prank. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I actually mute my phone before I open that app. <laughs> 
Oh, I agree fully. Yeah, I, I I feel so old when I go on it because I don't understand it. So oh, I think yeah. it's great, <laughs> but I just I think it's actually kind of awesome. But I'm like, okay, I'd actually pay some teenager to do this. For yeah, me. <laughs> perhaps yeah. that's what I do need to do. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so um, obviously, yeah, with the album coming, exciting times, and and obviously with that, um, normally comes shows, uh, and I know that you know in our previous uh communications with each other you've touched on you know there's some plans afoot to try and get across to the uk so i mean yeah. f- f- for both listeners that are obviously joining familiar with yourself in australia and obviously listeners in the uk checking you out you know uh, what are your um plans you know when when might australian and, and uk um fans expect to be able to catch you at a show um so in february i'm doing a quick australian tour um luckily with australian tours i got kind of friends around everywhere so it's just a text message away for each of them um to get those so i'm doing that in which i'm going to adelaide which i haven't done before that's like the thing about the uk versus australia which i've realized in booking a uk tour is the cities are just so far away from each other in australia yeah. when, when i was looking at it um with the uk tour i was like the longest possible journey we could do is manchester to brighton which is yeah. like eight and a half hours but I, we've done way longer than that in australia you know it was kind of like my, i was like should we just book that anyway we smartened up and realized that we can do way more things than do the manchester <laughs> um in in the uk um i've luckily got a built an amazing network of people like um um arms and hearts fraser morgan um KDMF, like just all these pog, like just so many Jake Martin. I just I'm just listing them now. <laughs> all these people I've met through emails. Um and yeah, we could we, my first show in the UK is April 6th in Colchester. Um and then we kind of go through to Bristol, to York, to Stourbridge, to I'm just gonna try to list them all. London City, King Kingston, um, Brighton about 12 shows across the country yeah for three weeks but yeah yeah i tried to list them off my head and i actually couldn't <laughs> well again listeners um i'm guessing the place to to keep track is uh, across social media uh, and get online and obviously search for ed and, and find a show and hopefully uh come along to it. it would be fantastic so i mean you must be excited at the prospect to coming across the uk oh, yeah exactly yeah um I have to say the folk punk thing in Australia is not exactly the biggest thing, but over there, there is just so many amazing bands that I can't yeah. wait to just go there and meet everyone, just have a chat after every show, like, I don't know, make some serious friendships over there. Yeah. I haven't been before either. So it's also part of that. I'm still going to have to do like all the Abbey Road and things like yeah. that. <laughs> but yeah, I'm so excited to go over there and play some music. Excellent, excellent, and we look forward to to having you for for sure. Um, which it, so it brings me on to the the final main section of the podcast is something we call set list science. So I uh, am a bit of a geek when it comes to to set lists. Um, so um, I just like to always ask the question: you know, How much importance do you as an artist put into the structure of your set list, and have you got any rules that you try to follow? Yeah. I do. Um, I kind of open up with a song that people know that I've released. That's not my best, but it's likable, you know? Like, yeah. it's not debatably bad. It's it's okay. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's, it's good enough. I mean, from my perspective, they can love it if they want to, but from, I'm like, this is this will work, you know? Um, then I go into another fun song, and then I go into one where this is something I've kind of learned over the past two years is especially with solo music and having to do a lot of talking. Um, third song is a great song to do your chat up before going into it. Now that's where you play your slow song. Cause if you do a nice calm introduction into your slow song, people will actually stop and listen to it. That's it. That's something I've learned rather than you kind of, you know, playing to a talking audience mm. sort of thing. Um, after that, go into another sl- go into another sad song without any kind of announcement, um, and then for the last, the next three songs, I think I'm up to that'll be about the next seven. Just do the fast hits, kind of in a row. 
let's say I'm just trying to think about tense on set list. Um, now the next part depends whether I'm acoustic or playing with my band. Um, UK I'll be acoustic, but yeah. Um, let's say acoustic. I'll play this song. Um, I'll play Criticize the Four. Let that kind of ring out and then go into my probably the song that's going to be the top single when the album's released. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's actually, there's actually a live video of it um, called Hey Noel. That, that's, that seems around Sydney circles. So people have heard it before. That's kind of my top one. And I'll make that. <laughs> I'll make everyone cry, cry when the shirt's finished. That's what the kind of guy is. <laughs> and then, yeah. then, then with the full punk rock, punk rock band stuff, I'll play like, it'll be very strange for me to go into kind of um, Hey Noel and the kind of sad song. So I'll play that out of the blue. And then we criticize the poor at the end. I'll often throw the guitar on the ground or something like that. Nice. A bit extra with that as the ending, you know, because it'd be pretty yeah. weird nice and soft and sad with the full band electric punk rock show but yeah yeah you gotta leave uh, leave them with uh, impressions that either yeah uh, a big show like uh you know chucking the guitar down or making them cry as you say for the acoustic show yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, e yeah. either way you're leaving them uh with, with something which is fantastic yeah. and yeah not, uh, again I, I love to, to hear us talk about how they formulate this at this because as, as a fan watching you know I, I can often tell the artists that have put effort into you know what they're playing where yeah, of course. I think I have it just here. My plan for the UK. If you want to have a quick look there? <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I have followed that formula. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent, wow. excellent. Um, so obviously you're going to be coming across the UK and playing some of our vital, vital grassroots music venues, um, which are making a big song and dance about at the minute. Because in the UK, in about a week's time, we've got uh, Independent Venue Week. So, you know, all the artists I've been speaking to for the last kind of two months, I've, I've been asking them to put a spotlight, you know, and give a shout out to, to one of their favourite uh, local venues. And of course, it's not just the UK that have these venues that are vital to the ecosystem of, of, of you know, grassroots music. And uh, obviously Australia will do as well. So, you know, I want to offer you the same opportunity to, you know, throw, throw a spotlight on, on, a, on a venue or two um, that you think do great, great work. Um, let's say... It just closed down, but for, oh, it just closed down, but it was amazing for international bands and walking crowd. There was Frankie's Pizza, which was like every tourist would, every tourist would come here and go there. Um, for, um, otherwise, um, for acoustic venues, the Midnight Special in Sydney is my absolute favourite. The staff, everyone, they're super lovely. Um, they're so generous to me like for letting me play there a few times and so on and so forth. And it's always just a great show. And you could be playing, they often just do like folky Wednesday nights and stuff like that. Um, there's also Lazy Bones Lounge in Sydney, which is like almost a jazz bar, but they have their month monthly folk punk night, which is just fantastic as well. Um, in Melbourne, let's say where I'd go in Melbourne, the last chance in Melbourne, I'll give them, they're, they're also a super generous group of people and some of the sickest venue managers I've ever met. From when I was playing in my punk rock band to doing um to doing the front bar evening Saturday show solo. Like they are some of the sickest people I've ever met I've ever met. Um with the UK, I'll give one shout out. Um 45 Cafe in York. They've oh, been yeah. just legends and same with the fighting cox cafe in kingston those two have been like super over emails i can tell that they're the best the sickest people yeah oh excellent excellent and, and it is the people behind these venues that are ever so important because you know i, I imagine it's similar in, the, in australia but of course in, in the uk you know uh, cost of living crisis etc cetera, etc cetera. music industry is tough yeah. as it is you know these people aren't necessarily um you know booking these shows and running these venues to make a profit not in 2023 oh. they're not anyway they're doing it for oh. love of the music which is so important um yeah yeah well obviously thank you so much for joining me ed for, for the chat it has been absolutely fantastic and i for one will certainly be trying to pop along to a show when you're over uh in yeah. april um and oh. obviously listeners need to make sure they do that as well um what would be your last message for, for those people listening today um i can't wait to meet you in the uk yeah yeah and that is 
I think the most important message here, definitely. Uh, and we can't wait to, to meet you either. Um, so, yeah, listeners, again, uh, Ed Barnes AU across social media. Keep in touch. Um, find a show if you can. Obviously, check out the album in September. Um, and, yeah, Ed, um, hopefully we'll, we'll be hearing a lot more uh, of your name in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. Oh, thank you everyone for listening. I really do hope you enjoyed that chat there with Ed Barnes. Make sure you check out his single, Criticise the Poor, over on our Discover New Music playlist on Spotify. And of course, follow Ed on social media. You can also follow Full Pelt on social media. We are on Facebook at Full Pelt and on Twitter and Instagram at Full Pelt Music. And finally, if you would, please do hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, wherever you're watching or listening, because we'll be back very soon for another episode of the Discover New Music Podcast.